June is our birthday. And also, um, July the 4th, before we can go out and shoot fireworks and all that cool stuff, we're going to come in here. We're going to have baptisms and baby dedications because we haven't done that in a while. Um, last time we did baptisms, it was, a, it was phenomenal. Me and Cody spent like four days trying to fill up a baptism tank through the uh, sink of the church instead of uh, an outside thing. So um, we're going to have to figure that out, how we're going to do that again. Good news is out here we do have an outside thing we can fill it up with, and we can just do it outside if it's pretty. So um, it's 4th of July. It should be pretty. Cross our fingers. Also, um, I heard from a, a source, wink, wink, fireworks are super expensive this year. So, <laughs> um, But we're going to shoot them anyway, somewhere, some way, somehow. So um, we'll get together and see what we're doing about barbecuing and eating hot dogs and hamburgers and having fun on that day as well. Amen. So what, what I want to do, something cool that I decided to do last night is all throughout this month, you guys, um, what I want you to do is go on our social media, either Facebook or Instagram, and put a comment on there, uh, just put a post on there, a status, tag us in a status of one of your most favorite memories over the last four years. Um, we just want to go back and just, if you have pictures or anything like that, we just want to go back and kind of just reflect on even the small things that God has done here. Amen. Because it's good to even reflect on the small things. Amen. So um, do that for me. Share our stuff. Uh, and that's all of my announcements uh, for this morning. I didn't tell Heather to do that. She did an awesome job, though. So um, who's ready for the word? Yes. About two people are ready for the word this morning. Come on, who's ready for the word? I have been, if you haven't noticed, over the last, and if you go, you can go to our YouTube channel. Um, it's my summit, LLC, or the Summit Church, Lawrence County, too. And look up, and we have our, our uh, messages for the last several months on there. And even on our website, you can go back and watch our messages or listen to them as well. And you'll notice that over the last several months, I have preached probably twice in like three months. Um, because I really wanted to focus on getting Aria here and making sure my family's good and let Pastor Devin and our other speakers come in and speak as well just during that time so over that time I've not been uh, okay I'm not just been sitting at home eating Doritos and not getting ready for church I have been there's this word that has been burning on the inside of me that I didn't feel released to preach until today so you know those things those messages that you sit months on um let me get in the middle here I feel so to the side um they it's Let's go ahead and let's be prepared. Let's put our, put our steel-toed boots on this morning because this is something that I feel not only is a word for us in this house, but it's a generational word. I really I don't say that much because I don't like to boost what I preach up very too much or at all. I'd much rather hear uh, Pastor Angela or somebody else get up here and preach a message like this. So pray for me as I'm preaching this too because I really, this is one of those words that I really feel like needs to get out more than just here. I really do feel this this morning. And I don't say that because I, I could care less if we continue to have this many people in the church, four people in the church, and we just do go after God here and nobody else hears what I have to say. But I really feel like this message is so important. Okay? So get you put, pay attention. Uh, and I don't, I'm not trying to force you, this is not school, but I need you to listen this morning because I feel like it's detrimental for our lives. I really do feel that. So let's pray and prepare ourselves this morning. Father, go on everybody in the house to pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that you are enough. And God, as I deliver this message this morning, I pray that it, it, it sits on fertile ground, God, that it that it's not seen as, as me speaking this morning, but it's, it's, they hear the voice of God this morning. As, as this word goes out, I thank you for the opportunity to be, be here this morning. I thank you for this family. I thank you for the ones that are coming in. I thank you for the ones that are already here. God, I thank you for your blessings, little blessings in every single moment of every day. I thank you for my family. I thank you for my friends. And I thank you that you're not done. And, we th and I just want to thank you one more time. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I'm going to start you off with a question this morning. And it's the title of my message. The title of my message this morning is this. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Already. It's quiet already this morning. It's very intense. When you, have you ever asked this question before? And in, in when you look at the world news, if you look at your own life, have you ever asked the question, Jesus, where are you? When you see innocent people being killed, when you see missionaries being killed, when you see children being molested and murdered, do you, ask, do you ever ask that question, Jesus, where are you? Where is Jesus? Let's go to the book of Luke. Chapter 2, verse 41. We're going to read from 41 to 49. On the screen, I'm going to have it in the NIV. I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. So, here we go. You get there, say word. Nobody's there. Word. It's on the screens here. Ready? Be, come on, you can amen me this morning. You can listen and amen me. Come on. So, verse 41. Every year, Jesus' parents went to worship at Jerusalem during the Passover festival. When Jesus turned 12, his parents took him to Jerusalem to observe the Passover as was their custom. A full day after they began, listen to this, a full day after they began their journey home, Joseph and Mary realized that Jesus was missing. They had assumed he was somewhere in the entourage, but he was nowhere to be found. After a frantic search among relatives and friends, Mary and Joseph returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After being separated from him for three days, Days. They finally found him in the temple, sitting amongst the Jewish teachers, listening to them and asking probing questions. All who heard Jesus speak were awestruck at his intelligent understanding of all that was being discussed and at his wise answers to their questions. His parents were shocked to find him there, and Mary scolded him, saying, Whoa, wait a minute. You mean Jesus got corrected here? He did. Son, your father and I have searched for you everywhere. Have you ever had a kid get lost before? I remember one time when we were younger, um, when I was younger, um, we had lost Luke. We couldn't find him in the house. You remember that? Remember that? Couldn't find him. And we screamed everywhere. And I think he was hiding in the back closet somewhere. I think, was it with you? Yeah. We were, <laughs> we were looking, I mean, we looked everywhere and could not find him. And he was hiding in the back closet. And you freak out, right? You just freak out. And those, and those, I freak out when Roman moves a little bit away from me when I'm trying to put him in the truck or in, in the car seat. I literally like, hey, 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 where you at? Where you at? Where you at? This was Mary and Joseph's, like, can you imagine? Put yourself in this situation. We've searched for you everywhere. We've been worried sick over finding you. Why would you do this to us? First off, you left him. Hear me this. They left him. They went, across, they went all, all along their journey and didn't even look for him. Let, it, let that sink for a moment. I ain't even got to preach nothing there. Jesus said to them, why would you need to search for me? Don't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house consumed with him? Listen to the story. A family was doing some last-minute Christmas shopping in the mall. Suddenly, in the midst of, of all the fun and excitement, someone noticed that little three-year-old Matthew was gone. Terror immediately gripped his parents. They had heard stories about little children being kidnapped in malls, never again to be seen. They split up, each member of the family taking an assigned area to the mall to search for the child. As each one completed the search of their assignment area, they returned to the place where they had agreed to meet. No one, it seems, had been able to find the missing child. Then the boy's grandfather appeared, holding little Matthew in his hand. When they asked the grandfather where he had been found, the boy answered, or where he had found the boy, the grandfather answered, he was at the candy counter. You should have seen him. His eyes came just about as high as the candy and he was standing, in his, standing with his little hands behind, the back, behind his back, moving his head back and forth, surveying all the delicious candy. Matthew didn't look lost. He didn't even know he was, he was lost. And he certainly, they didn't think he was in danger. After all, 
Matthew was right where they left him. Sometimes we lose Jesus. It gets so easy to go through life and just leave him out of our lives. It gets so easy to get busy. It gets so easy to get consumed with I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And I've got to do all these different things. And I've got to make sure that this is going right. And I've got to make sure my family's okay. And I've got to make sure that I'm standing strong for all this stuff. And all along, we're going in a direction and Jesus is nowhere to be found. It's so easy to get consumed with your day and get consumed with your job and get consumed with your finances. But it also is easy to be consumed by yourself. It's so easy to go throughout our life and just leave Jesus out of our lives. Everything, hear me this morning, everything is pulling at your attention. Wanting to become the focal point of your life. Everything. Let me give you job. Hobbies. Those are the two that everybody's like, oh, that's it. I'm going to go even further. Family. It's so easy to be consumed by all these different things. And, re- and everything becomes so important and gets such... We get so focused on it that we don't even realize that it has stole our attention. And as we were doing this, we have walked on, walked on ahead and we left Jesus back here standing. Write this down. Not every good thing is a God thing. Not every good thing is a God thing. We see things that are good for our lives and we pursue that, never looking to our right or left to see if Jesus is with us when we go. You can be on a path that seems like a good thing and Holy Spirit is nowhere to be found. You can be on a path that seems like it's good for you But that's not the path that Jesus actually wanted you to take. Jesus actually lived his life like this. I don't do anything until I see the Father do it first. Basically what he was saying is if the Father doesn't go, then I don't go. (sighs) Think about this. Good things. Great things. The man sitting at the gate of beautiful. Jesus passed by him every single day. And the good thing would have been to heal the man But Jesus passed by him because he didn't see the Father do it first. If he did see the Father do it, it wasn't by Jesus' hands, it was by Peter's. But what if Jesus would have went ahead and healed the man? He'd have been out of the will of the Father. Listen, I'm going to say something profound. Being out of the will of the Father is just as bad as being in an adultery. Being out of the will of the Father is just as bad as committing murder. You know why? Because when we get outside the will of the Father, we get into anxiety and fear. Listen to the commandment. Do not worry. All over the Bible it says, "Do." do you, I said it last week, 365 times in the Bible there's a commandment that says, Do not not fear. It's not, hey, I'm asking you if you would please just for a minute be brave. Don't, don't be afraid. It's a commandment. Three, every day of the year, there's a commandment over your day. Do not fear. And when we walk outside of the will of the Father, we get in being... And I hate to say this because we, we are in such a, such a council court, a culture and so just, I just want to say it, pansy-wansy and just want to be, and we don't even understand. Listen, if you are in anxiety, you're outside the will of God. And I'm not saying you're in some horrible sin. What I'm saying is this, somewhere along the line, you went somewhere that he didn't go. The 
what does the Bible say? What does the word say? Be what for what? Be anxious for nothing. You can get mad at me all you want to today because I said that. But then I'll point you to that scripture in the Bible. Be anxious for nothing. Is the word true? Does it guide our lives? Then why do we leave some of this stuff out? You know why? Because if it, we like to be in control ourselves. Your anxiety and your worry and your fear is mostly because you're trying to fix the situation on your own. If a good thing, listen, if, the, if a good thing lifts anything else up but Jesus, then that thing being lifted up is getting worship and being enthroned, not him. Hear me this morning. If anything is being lifted up besides Jesus, it is getting worship. What you do or put in your life should make his name famous, not yours. And I'm not talking about just celebrity fame. I'm talking about in your life, what you do and what you put into your life should bring him glory, not you. What you put into your life and what you do with your life, they should not, I'm going to use myself as an example, and should not be able to say, wow, Landon really did a good job there. They should be able to say, wow, God really did something there. I think Devin talked about this not too long ago. When everything that you do, do it as an act of worship unto the Lord. Everything. Why do we leave that out? Do it as an act of worship to the Lord. If I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm talking, I hadn't preached in a long time, so I'm going to talk about some stuff. If you go to work and you have to do your job, you are not doing it as worship to the Lord. If somebody in your upper management comes and looks at you and judges your character by the way that you work. And then you say, well, I'm a Christian. I hate working. I, we all do. We all do. First thing I'm going to do when I get to heaven is punch Adam right in the head. Not even... Everybody's so mad at Eve. I'm like, no, Adam, we're going to deal with you. You're getting punched right in the head. Everything. Not just one or two things. Well, I'll go to church. Half of us really don't do that. Um, I'll make sure that when I'm having a bad day, I'll play worship music in my car. Um, I'll put my Bible on my, on my, on my desk at work. I'll... Uh, I'll tell people that I love Jesus, but when something goes wrong, I don't have peace, joy, or anything showing. Like we work, well, don't don't even get me started on my children when they start acting up. Like they got about three tries, and then my patience is wore out. Family members, I'm preaching to myself. Everything that we do. This is why you can have fellowship. I was talking to a guy about this. I think maybe, maybe me and Austin were talking about this yesterday or maybe somebody else. But this, I talked to some people at work about this too. You can have fellowship and sit down and play um, spades and feel as much Jesus in spades because you're literally coming together in family as much as you do sometimes going to church. Unless you're playing my mom and my cousin, and then they cheat, and they always win. And then if we start a fight. No, I'm just kidding. Everything that we do. When, I'm, when we go hang out and go grill hamburgers outside. Everything. When you're driving down the road and that person cuts you off. Or if you're me, when you're driving down the road and everything suddenly comes to a stop. And I'm like, what dummy has, and literally I'm like, half the time it ain't even a wreck. It's just somebody just not wanting to go fast enough. Devin understands. He knows what it's like coming across that bridge. 
But what we do and what, what we do and what we put into our life, here's the big thing. What you put into your life, what you put, what you allow into your ears, what you allow into your eyes, needs to lift Jesus up. There's nothing wrong with entertainment. There's nothing wrong with being entertained. There's nothing wrong with, with taking you honey and dancing to a good country song. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is this. When something can grip your soul and you put the focus on that one thing and Jesus all of a sudden goes missing, dancing with your baby into that country song can become an idol for you. Where's Jesus? It's quiet in here this morning. It's a hard word. I told you. It's going to get better, though. Listen, how do I know everything should lift them up? The scripture, Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to say it in the Passion Translation. Yahweh is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's dance and shout on that. More than enough. Amen. Everybody say amen. Y'all go quiet. Amen. We have more than enough. Amen. He offers us a resting place. You can take a nap. In his luxurious love this morning. Amen. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace near the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me the right path and leads me along his footsteps. Not mine. Not my friends. Not what culture is telling me. Not what self-help is telling me. What he is telling me for his righteousness. He brings his footsteps of his righteousness so that I can bring Honor to myself? No. To the world self? No. To him. Listen to me this morning. The biggest distraction that will make you lose Jesus faster than anything else is not hobbies, it's not your job, it's yourself. Hear me. Yourself is the biggest distraction. And you'll lose Jesus when you focus on yourself. This is the biggest thing in culture and everything that we hear right now. You need to take care of yourself. Hear it? Have you heard it? You need to take care of yourself. Yourself. You. You. Me. Me. I'm doing this for me. And yes, you need to take initiative and do stuff for yourself. I'm not telling you this morning to not take care of yourself. I have started a journey. By texting my aunt, who's here with us this morning, about how to lose weight because I've gained a lot of weight. And here, in a couple of weeks, she, they're about to break me in half. As soon as my wife gets cleared up, maybe before that. But I've quit drinking, uh, drinking regular cokes and drinking a lot of water, and it is the hardest thing. I'm doing that to better myself. But here's the thing: I wanted to make sure that I'm better for myself, better myself. Not so I can be better, but so I can show his glory better. So I can be a better father to my children later on. And even right now. And even if it says I'm doing this for me, my, the inside of me is saying, I'm not doing this. You're not doing this for Landon. You're doing this so you can portray the goodness of God better. Right? Have you ever said that before? You ever got mad at somebody and, and started to, I'm about to preach, I'm about to preach right here. You ever got mad at somebody and separated yourself from them and said, I'm separating from them because of me, doing it for me. I'm doing this for me. This is why, Heather, this is, this is what I've been talking about, the reason why I've been acting so weird the last couple of days. And you're like, what's going on? This right here. You ever said that? I'm doing this for me. If you do it under your own strength, you have built something that will crumble under the weight of pressure. If you do something for yourself, you have built something that will crumble, crumble under the weight of pressure. Crumble. Under the weight of pressure. Pressure. That's funny. I played that this morning on the bass. How funny. Pressure. Something that crumble under the weight of pressure. You ever... Here's me. We'll go with my weight loss journey. Here we go. Before I even, I don't even got one. I go, all right, starting to lose weight. Starting to lose weight. Here we go. It's that day. Day one. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, Angel's like, you're doing so good. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> for, two for three days, I've done really good. <laughs> look, look. And then I'll 
I'll be coming home and I'll just go to the refrigerator. I ain't even got to go home. I go to my mamma's house and go to the refrigerator because you know what? Back in the day, I always knew my uncle had a nice, cold, yellow sun drops sitting in there that he put in the freezer first and put in there. And I, I wouldn't even think about, about my weight loss journey. You know what I'd do? I'd be drink that thing up. I, this is what I do. I go, this is, I'm telling you some stuff that happens. I, weight loss journey, here we go. I eat, we eat supper. I go to my mamma's house. She's got something cooked. I sit at the table and continue to eat. I'm like, I'm hungry. No, you're not. It just looked good. Just because it looks good doesn't mean it's good for you. Just because it's set, here, you ready for this? Here, listen. Just because it's in front of you does not mean that it's good for you. Because it can taste so good. It can be so good, but be killing you on the inside. It could be so just, ah, oh, you sit there and look at it and you're like, oh man, this is going to be so great. And you eat it and all of a sudden, when you're, when you're 40, you're struggling with heart problems. And you don't even know what's going on on the inside of you because you don't care what's going on in the inside because you want to take care of what's going on on the outside. Listen to me this morning. Self-care at its core is selfish. Self-care at its core is selfish. Let me listen to self-care. We're like, oh, we're going to take care of ourselves. Listen to the dictionary definition. That's the word. Of selfish. You ready? Concern excessively or exclusively about oneself. Seeking or concentrating on one's advantage, pleasure, or well-being without the regard for others. Here's the problem. We try to take care of ourselves and get and literally don't care about what other people think or do or what we say to anybody else. You cannot follow Jesus and shut people out. If so, Jesus would have shut Peter out right before he even was able to tell him to deny him. If so, Judas would have never had the ability to betray him. If so, we wouldn't be here. But I'm not Jesus. He was perfect. Here's the thing. He didn't seek perfection. He was just holy. And being holy is what made him perfect. He wasn't just perfect. He was patient. And patient made him perfect. James 1.4 Holy, well, holy means perfection. No, it doesn't. It means separate, different. He's not calling you to be perfect. Hear me this morning. He's calling you just to be different. Different. Different like this. Your job's tanking and everybody thinks that, it, that everybody's about to get fired. And you stand there in the middle of peace and say, you know what? If it happens, guess what? I, my provider is not even this job in the first place. When you get the report from the doctor and you say, you know what? This looks bad in front of me, but I know a healer. That can make not just heal me and make myself better right now. But he can actually return me back to the original state and make me whole. But self-care at its core is selfish. Listen, hear me again. I'm not saying don't take care of yourself. Please, God, take care of yourself. Take a bath. Put some deodorant on. Brush your teeth. Go to the gym. Exercise. Drink more water. Here, let's go even further. Read your Bible. <laughs> Pray without ceasing. Worship and give Him thanks for He's been good your whole life. Take care of yourself. 
Listen, when you take care of yourself in those ways, you, be, you become more like him than you become more like you. Here's the problem. Not, again, not everything that feels good is good. Listen. It may, everything, not everything that feels good is good. It may feel good until that first sip of wine turns into a, to a whole bottle. It may feel good until that little bit of attention becomes broken covenant. It may feel good until. Is God there? Is Jesus there? Where's Jesus? Let me, I'm going to say this, public service announcement to every Christian in the world. You cannot get wholeness disconnected from the body. You cannot get wholeness disconnected from the body. How can you have your arm healed if it's laying on the floor rotting? The biggest stigma, one of the biggest stigmas right now in Christianity is I don't have to be connected to people to, be, to love Jesus. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to see them because I just love Jesus. Yeah, you may love Jesus, but you don't have no accountability. Nobody's correcting you. And I've seen more people over the last year since COVID go out and seek wholeness and disconnect themselves from the body and you're not getting whole at all. You're building yourself up. Because here's the thing. Landon cannot correct Landon. Landon cannot correct himself. He cannot sit there and your flesh will not correct itself. I need fellowship. I need pastors. I need leaders. I need people in my life to say, hey, you're not on the right path. Go this way. But listen, Landon's voice sounds better than Pastor Mark's voice. Landon's voice sounds better, way better than Pastor Chris's voice. My voice sounds better than my friend Hunter's voice when he's trying to... I'm, we're, I'm a pastor of this church, but he has every right to correct me. You know why? Because iron sharpens iron. Every right. When I am on the wrong path... If you are a God-loving, in the Bible, Holy Spirit-filled Christian, you have the right to correct. But you don't get that outside of the body. Listen to what the scripture says about you can't get wholeness outside of the body. Isaiah 53, 1 through 5 says, Who has truly believed our revelation? To whom will Yahweh reveal his mighty arm? He sprouted up like a tender plant before the Lord, like a root in part soul. He possessed no distinguishing beauty or outward splendor to catch our attention. Nothing special in his appearance to make us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of deep sorrows, who was no stranger to suffering and grief. We hid our faces from him in disgust and considered him a nobody worthy of respect. Yet, he was the one who carried our sicknesses. And endured the tor torment of our suffering. We viewed him as one who was being punished for something he had done himself. But as one who was struck down by God and brought low. But it was because of our rebellious deeds that he was pierced. And because of our sins that he was crushed. He endured this punishment so that we can be made completely whole. And in his wounding we found, we found our healing. Wholeness comes from Jesus. It doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from Jesus. First Corinthians, first Corinthians, I said it like first Corinthians. Medea. First Corinthians 12, 12 through 26. It says, I'm not going to read this whole thing. It's just talking about the human body is one, though it has many parts together for one body, one body, one body. Very excited. And water got stuck in my throat a little bit there. <laughs> Just says, our body is made up of many parts, right? Our body is made up of really a lot of parts. And we don't understand that the eyelash is just as important as the liver. We don't understand that the smallest parts of our, of our body 
is so important because it protects us from so many different ways, different things. But this is what we like to do. We like to say, all right, you know what? I've been offended by the church. So this is my finger. I'm cutting it off. My finger's been broken. So to heal myself, I'm going to cut my finger off. What does that, how does that even make sense? That's what I threatened my son with when he says he's hurt. Oh, my toe hurts. I'm like, come here. Let me cut it off. And then all of a sudden he's like, nope, it's fine. But that's what we like to do in our lives, in our Christian walk. I'm broken. I need to be fixed. So instead of allowing healing to come, we say, all right, let's just cut ourselves off. (laughs) I'd rather deal with not having this here than to go through the pain of it being healed. Right now, Devin is sitting in the back because he was dumb and jumped out of a tree. Played the drums today with one leg. The healing process for Devin's ankle is going to be, it's going to hurt. It's not going to feel good. But if he went home today and was like, this hurts too bad and cuts it, cut it off, it's going to hurt worse. And it can never be healed again because it's cut off. It begins to rot. It begins to decay. Why do we do that in our own lives? Why do we get broken and we think that because we're broken, we have to cut ourselves off. I'm going to be honest with you. My wife had a C-section. And this is part of her healing process. She's got to get up and move. Getting up and moving for her, especially at the very beginning, no other word for it, sucked. It hurt really bad. But to start the healing process, she had to go through a little bit of uncomfort first. So that she can be whole again. And not only whole again, but she produced something out of that pain for a little while. When you when a when a woman births a child, imagine if your mama in the middle of you be coming here said, You know what? I'm done. Time out. I'm out. Done. That's what we do. Right before right before something's about to be birthed. We cut ourselves off. Quiet this morning. When you are low, burned out, instead of doing things that are fleshly desires, you must feed your spirit. We have to start prioritizing spirit care. This means realizing that you need something greater than your than what you yourself can give. If you feel like you've lost yourself, it means that somewhere along the way you've not just lost yourself, you've lost him. Because your true best self is not found in you. It's found in the eyes of Jesus. Wow. Losing Jesus is not something that we notice at first. Notice this. I'm almost done. Mary and Joseph went a whole day. This is Jesus. Mary didn't. Mary was a virgin. She had this baby. Jesus, the Messiah, she watched this boy grow up to be 12 years old. She, tra- she has walked a whole day. Walked a whole day. And then all of a sudden she said, Joseph. <laughs> it's a lot my mama and Joseph. What? Where's Jesus? Well, I thought he was with you. I thought he was walking with you. Oh, he's got to be in the crowd. He's definitely got to be in all this. Jesus, where are you? Where are you? And then they look all for him throughout that day and they go, shoot, he's lost. When I look at this and I go, Mary, Joseph, come on. The responsibility in your hands right there. This is Jesus. If something happens to him, we are all, yeah, fill in the blank. (laughs) We are in trouble if something happens to him. And I'm judging Mary and realizing this happens to me almost every other week. Come on. The responsibility you have. Listen. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives on the inside of you. 
You are not only just saved, you are now co-heirs with Jesus. Seated, seated at the right hand of the Father in Him right now. You are Jesus to this world right now. Jesus thought, Jesus said, this is what He said, literally. It's what, if you go back and you go and study and you get in theology, this is Jesus' mindset. One of me is great. One of me will change history. But billions of me will change the future. So he, when he died, he said, it's good that I go. Can you imagine talk, him talking to the disciples on that day? It's good that I go. And the disciples were like, <laughs> are you serious? It's good that I go so the one that's been waiting this whole time can come and be with you. Holy Spirit was not just here so we could have a good church service. So we can dance and sing and you should be doing that just because you're thankful, not because Holy Spirit's inside of you. David didn't even have Holy Spirit in him, and he was able to do it. Holy Spirit is there for you to become like Jesus. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Nobody has more power and more love and more of a sound mind than Jesus. I'm not Jesus. No, but you're being formed into him. You are a reflection of him on every single day. And here's the thing. We're trying to be a reflection with no body to reflect. Like holding a mirror out and going. Like you're standing, you're standing behind the mirror. Instead of standing in front of it and letting it reflect out. They th in our, our lives, we think Jesus must be with us. They were on their way home. It was a good thing. They were ready to go home, eat some good cornbread and pinto beans. They've been, in, they've been in church service for the whole week. Passover, worshiping, just all this stuff, sacrificing. They were ready to go home. You know how it is after church on a Sunday morning. You're ready to go home, eat you some lunch, and take you a nap. <laughs> Nothing more holy than a nap. Jesus took naps all the time. That's what they were doing. They were like, all right, got done, got our, got our duty done, going, to, going home. And all of a sudden they say, huh. Where's Jesus? Where is he? They were doing a good thing, but somewhere along the way they lost him. Not only... They thought, not only did they lose him, they thought he was the one, the entourage. They thought all this stuff. Listen, I need to tell you something. Just, here's the good news. Just because you lose Jesus doesn't mean it takes long to find him. <laughs> Hear me this morning. Just because you lose, have lost him, doesn't mean it should take long to find him. How do I know this? It literally says this that in that same scripture. They searched for him for three whole days. Searched for him. Only to find him where they left him. Only to find him in the temple being about his father's business. If they would have just went back to where they know they could have met him. Hear me this morning. If they could have just went back to where they know that he was there all the time. If you can just get your family back to the church. If you can just get yourself back. Because here, well, Pastor, I don't have to go to church. Be, no, you don't. But I can tell you something. When I'm at home and watching the Yankees and yelling at the TV, Jesus is nowhere to be found. When I'm at home watching some movie, I, I'm going to use that as an example. If I'm at home watching The Godfather, or I'm watching Scarface say hello to my little friend. Jesus is nowhere to be found. But I can guarantee you every Sunday morning when I walk into the doors of the church, he's there to meet me. You can have Jesus just as much at home. You can. You can have Jesus at home. But in those moments, he ain't nowhere to be found. And sometimes I like to watch one episode after another episode after another one and after another. And all of a sudden, I've done watch all of Yellowstone. And Jesus is nowhere to be found. But on Sunday morning, 
when the worship is lifted, guess what? He's there where we left him. <laughs> this is the place where the most judgment, Jesus was found where the most judgment was happening. Jesus was found in the very place where the people were fixing, the same people that he was sitting amongst were fixing to kill him just 11 years later. And did that stop him from being there? No. Where did 21 years, I'm sorry, not 11, 21, good job, thank you. My math was off. Where's Roman at? He can tell me how much it was. Think about that. In our own lives, throughout the day, all we have, it doesn't take long to find him if we just go back to where we left him. Just go back to where we left him. It may not have been at church. You may have, you may have every time you may have, you may have left him in your car when you got out of the car to go to work. You may have left him at home. You may have left him wherever. It doesn't, listen, we think, we think it takes step one to step seven to find Jesus. We think it takes a lifetime to find him. If we think somebody has left him somewhere, we think it takes so long. They've got to do this whole thing. They've got to, they've got to blah, 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 blah. I'm here to tell you this morning, this morning, today, today, when Brett Terry comes back, it's going to be just like nothing else happened. Amen. We're not going to start another 18-step program because you know what? You can find Jesus in a moment. You could find Jesus in a moment, just like that. Why do we make it so hard to find him? You know why? Because we're too, we're too prideful and too embarrassed to say, you know what? I left him. Just like, just like last week when I came in, first time we ever had a newborn and a four-year-old here. Look, I left the wipes at home. Left them at home. Left them completely at home. Not only that, the only person in the church that day with wipes was Charity. And Charity had to go pick up her kids. And guess what? Aria had no wipes. And at first I was like, I didn't leave, I didn't leave those wipes. They're in there somewhere. We made it work. We used paper towels. She wasn't happy about it, but we did we okay. We wet them. We wet them. But I left the wipes at home. And at first, I was like, no, nope, I, mm, I put them in there. I know. I know that they're there. I know. And when I really should have just said, hun, I left them and got my butt in the car and went to the Dollar General and got some more wipes. But I spent more time saying that they were in there instead of just admitting that I left it somewhere. <laughs> we spend more time trying to say wholeness is there instead of admitting we left it with Jesus somewhere. <laughs> I'm almost done, guys. We're going to go eat. Finishing right here. Ready? Before you move, before you do that thing, before you put that into your life, before you let that person have a voice, you can have a relationship with a person and not let them have a voice in what you're doing. What we like to do is cut off the voice and the relationship instead of just cutting off the voice. Ask yourself, where is Jesus? Say it. Where is Jesus? Say it again. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Write it on your forehead. Put it on your mirror. Put it on your refrigerator. Where is Jesus? Put it in your car. When you get into your car, you can look at him and say, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? He needs to be involved in your everyday. Listen, sometimes you and I lose Jesus. We get so busy in our daily routine and doing what seems good that we never give him a thought. Then one day we wake up and realize he's gone and out of our lives. Do you know what we need to do when that happens? We just need to go back to the place we left him. Listen, I'm close with you. Close with this. There is where we find him, right there. And guess what he's doing? He's waiting for us. 
Somebody get the lights. Angel, you want to play the acoustic? Or play piano? Unmute her piano and her mic too, just in case. Yeah, just in case. Let's all stand in the room to this, tonight or this morning. I keep thinking we're at night services for some reason. And this is what I want to do. For once in the last. And a handful of times over the last four years, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an altar call this morning. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come up here, stand, sit, kneel, whatever you need to do. But I know myself, I need to find Jesus this morning. I need to ask myself, where is he? And I need to pick him back up where I left him. So if that's you this morning and you want to join with every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm just going to give you an opportunity this morning. I'm just going to count to three. And if you want to come up here and, and pray with us, kneel, stand, whatever. If you're like me and you need to be reminded to ask yourself, where is Jesus? Or if you need to just pick him up, pick him up where you left him. These altars are open. One, two, three. Come join us.